level in the intervention have an impact on treatment outcome. Now, logically, it would make sense, right, that there should be a positive impact, right? But I wanted to know, is, was there a statistical impact, significant impact on treatment outcome? That's what I wanted to know. So this is what I wanted to do for my study. Now, I don't know, has anybody heard of biofeedback? You've heard of it. Do you know what it means, though? Have you heard? Maybe don't know. Maybe. The bio part is supposed to be biological. Right. It really should be physio feedback, I think, because it's not about biological feedback. It's about physiological feedback. I mean, we don't look at the cells. We look at things like muscle tension, heart rate, you know, body temperature, that sort of thing. So it's not biological feedback, it's more physiological feedback. And the, the concept is that we get feedback from either a standalone machine that gives you feedback, or a computer that has software on it and it gives you feedback. Uh, here's some of the some of the software out there. This is just, just a little little slight picture of the programs out there and the types of feedback that might be provided to you. Uh, you know, things that'll kind of show little graphs of uh, where your muscle tension is, that sort of thing. And, and the concept here is if you're working on, for example, reducing muscle tension, and you're getting feedback on the techniques that you're using, is it really reducing your muscle tension? And, and as you keep practicing the technique, the feedback helps you improve your techniques so that you actually are making an inroad on reducing the muscle tension. And sometimes you can get so good at this stuff that eventually you don't even need the equipment to give you feedback. You know at any given moment what your body is doing. And, and, and if you have a presenting problem like tension headaches and you've learned the techniques to help you reduce muscle tension, you may even be able to circumvent, prevent a tension headache from coming on. You know, so that's that's the power of this this intervention. So it's it's physiological feedback, and and the feedback is helpful. It, it kind of teaches it teaches you what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. Maybe that technique doesn't work for you at all, because we know in rel relaxation training we have all sorts of techniques we can teach you to relax. And, uh, do you guys have an arsenal of relaxation? Working out, yes, yes, working out helps us. You know, drinking water, right? Yes. <laughs> Eating chocolate. Eating chocolate, okay. <laughs> well, other things like breathing exercises, uh, re uh, reducing muscle tension. Imagine such a, somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Imagine imagery is very good at helping you relax. You know? Thinking of a relaxing scene. Visualizing a visualizing. calm state. Yeah. I mean, uh, what, what, what is, give, give me a, I guess, a place in your mind that represents some sort of scene, like an ocean or something, you know, that for you would be relaxing if you put yourself in that scene. Mm -hmm. What's that? An ocean? <laughs> an ocean, right next to the ocean, right. or a beach. Same thing? Or different? Yeah. Ocean. Ocean. <laughs> I love the beach. The beach, too. Next to a campfire. Campfire. Oh, I guess I can ask you. Not on my phone, really. Next to chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. I think the chocolate factory. Chocolate factory. Chocolate factory. Shopping? Yes. <laughs> Mountains. The Mountains. Yes. Yeah. Looking at the, the shore and the mountains from the ocean. Ah, so seeing both both those images at the same time. So so with imagery, what we like to do when we're trying to teach a person to relax, you know, and if we're using imagery, is we, we try to get them to conjure up the image with as many senses as possible. So not only what are you seeing, what are you hearing? What are you feeling? I mean, if you're at the ocean, you probably feel sand underneath your toes, right? It would be warm sand. You feel the sun on 
on the show, what would you be hearing? An emotion. The waves crashing. What else would you hear? Birds. Maybe the birds. Birds. Place. birds and gulls. Yeah. You know, maybe the, there are trees around, you know, a few trees, and you can kind of hear the, the wind blowing through the, the leaves, yeah. that sort of thing. And so so you're, you're, you're trying to trying to conjure up this image with as many sensory inputs as possible. And, and as you work with the imagery, if you're hooked up to some biofeedback equipment, you can see if the imagery is actually helping you relax. Because I remember one time uh, at some sort of seminar, we were actually we kind of paired up. Our group kind of uh, got together in pairs, and, and we, were, we were trying to help each other relax. And, and of course, for me, it's the ocean. So I, I was starting to really calmly just walk this person through the ocean sea. And I thought I was doing such a great job, you know. <laughs> and, and, and then she said, well, that was pretty good, but you know, I don't like it. I'm afraid of the water. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, gotta, you gotta see what works, you know. What, what works? Is it really working, that imagery, for you? Or if I switch over to a campfire, you said campfire, so it's a right? If I switch over, does that work better for me? the ocean? You know? So the feedback will be helpful for that process. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of like anything else in life. I mean, like if you're learning to play softball, you have a coach who's teaching you the tricks of the trade, so to speak, and you learn, you know, if you're playing infield, you, you want to stand here, you want to keep your mid on the ground type of thing. And, and, and you're learning techniques, how to bat and that sort of thing. And, and you don't improve unless you get practice and you get feed, corrective feedback. And so the biofeedback is, is trying to provide you some corrective feedback in the process. And there are different types of biofeedback. You've got EMG, electromyographic biofeedback. So that really measures muscle tension. You, you've got a couple electrodes that tries to measure the muscle tension in a major muscle group. And so you get feedback on whether what you're doing, whatever technique you're using, is actually reducing the muscle tension. Then you have GSR, which is galvanic skin response, which looks at electrical resistance underneath the skin. And uh, a measure of that is, is sweat. You know, if you perspire, you're anxious, right? Usually, if you're not exercising, per se. You know, that could be a sign of arousal, anxiety, that sort of thing. So you're trying to teach people how to reduce that reaction in your body. EEG is electroencephalographic. Now we're looking at brainwave patterns. We look at alpha-theta training. We look at beta training. That can be helpful alpha-theta with substance abuse populations and beta training with ADHD populations and so forth. Thermal biofeedback, we'll get to that in a bit. Heart rate, respiration, blood pressure, all sorts of different areas that you can focus on in terms of biofeedback. Uh, so the different equipment. But everything is, is similar in the sense it's providing you feedback. So you can make adjustments to improve whatever techniques that you're using to treat whatever presenting problem you have. And biofeedback is used a lot for anxiety-related anxiety complaints, pain-related complaints as well. Those two domains are big key factors in biofeedback. So um, I decided to do my study on, on migraines and biofeedback. Because I, I was in the military at the time, and I was at uh, Midwestern Military Hospital. And we ran a biofeedback program. And I was in charge of it. And, and so, nice, nice combination. I'm in charge of a program. I have a ready pool of possible subjects if I want to collect data. You know? So you get the right permission to do that, and then you move on. So, so I decided I would look at migraines. Um, and really, biofeedback is all about establishing mind-body balance. You know, we know the body can affect the mind, right? If we're dealing with chronic pain, we're probably a little depressed, right? We know the mind can have an effect on the body, too. If I'm having a good day, you know, let's say I, uh, I'm having, well, let's say I'm having a bad day, really bad day. 
had a fight with my parents, had a fight with my spouse. And I, you know, I, I, I just had an awful day at work. I come home and I go to pick up the mail. As I'm heading out to pick up the mail from the mailbox, I trip, stub my toe. And I, I, in the mail, I got a letter from the IRS saying that they want to audit me. Okay. So now I stub my toe. I'm going to feel that pain differently. Let's, let's change the scenario completely. I've had a great day with my parents. My, my, my spouse was just wonderful to me today. Uh, I had a great day at work. Fun. People, people were nice to me. It was, everything went well. They bugged me. It's a great day. I, I go to the mailbox and then I get a, a check from the IRS for five thousand dollars because I get a good tax return. <laughs> I trip. I step. My toe. Okay, it's a different world in terms of how I feel at pain. You know, bad day versus good day, right? So mind body balance has an impact. And so that, that's what we're, we're assuming. We're assuming that that's quite well. My brain yeah, buys into a, what's called a vascular theory. Some of you may have had migraines or know someone who suffers from migraines. But this theory has been around since the 1950s. And it was proposed by a guy by the name of Harold Wolf, who came up with this concept that what migraines are, now let me get slowly kind of walk you through this and see if it makes sense to you. Uh, something happens and I'm put in a stressful situation, okay? Uh, norepinephrine is released in my system, which puts me into a fight or flight, a fight or flight mode, right? Okay. So my body is keen up, all the adrenaline, all that stuff is going through my system. I'm getting keyed up, fight or flight. So what's happening in my brain are the blood vessels are constricting. Pumped up, those are constricting my but that doesn't hurt me in terms of my brain. So what happens for some people, though, is once the, the stress is, is diminishing or going away or whatever, and you're starting to calm down, for some people, the constriction has caused cerebral uh, anoxia, which is a little, a little oxygen deprivation to the brain. And the body recognizes this. And for some people... When it recognizes this, for those people it occurs to, the body then releases certain chemicals and the blood vessels dilate. But they get too big. It overcompensates. For some people, it doesn't go back to normal size. It gets bigger than what it should be. And so when, when the blood vessels get too big, they start agitating the surrounding pain receptors. That's where the migraine comes into play. So when you take medications to help you with the migraine, what it, it does is it tries to constrict the blood vessels back down to normal size. That's what it tries to do, that's whatever else that you're taking from the migraine. Okay, so what we do with migraines, uh, with biofeedback, is we do thermal biofeedback. So what we do is we have people up to some probes, which measures body temperature. And what you're aiming for, you know, our core temperature, what's our core temperature? 98.6, right? But, but that's not what it is in the experiments. But you want to try to get up to 94 degrees. If you're a migraine sufferer, you want to get, try to get up to 94 degrees in the experiments. And I think about that. If I'm warming my hands with my mommy, and people can do this, you can actually do this with practice. I can warm my hands with What's happened to my blood vessels in my hands? If, if, if they're warming up, what's, they're, they're getting bigger, right? Because the blood is rushing to the hands. It's trying to warm my hands. They're getting bigger. Then what's happening to the blood vessels in the brain? They're getting small. So they're going back to normal size, which is what the medications try to do. So that's the theory behind my brain. And biofeedback is just trying to tap into what we know works via medications, which is what we're trying to do with them. Now, how do you warm your hands? That's the that's a key. You get a little, you get hooked up to some equipment, you get some feedback. How do you warm your hands? For me, it's it's a campfire. For me, what works? I I image my hands over a campfire. 
And then I try to get my hands to tingle. I try to create a tingling sensation and my hands over camera. And I can actually warm my hands almost 10 degrees with, with, with the feedback mechanism. You know? so, and I, we have equipment. Maybe we'll have time to show you. It has this nice little, nice music. And you kind of go around in a circle. And you can visually see the warming of the hands while, while it's going around in the circle in a certain direction. And the music keeps kind of pleasantly going up. That means that your hands are warm. When it stops, when you're maintaining, it starts to go down. You know, it'll, it'll kind of signal to you that it's going up. So with practice, you can actually keep it going up. And 94 degrees is what you want. So, so if you're a person who has migraines, you know, and, and, and sick and tired of using medications, uh, I, you know, I, I would say, you know, don't quite give up the medications. I'm not an advocate to say anti-medication at all, because I'm, I'm a firm believer you, you need to use what works. But if you're a person who would like to try this and you develop some confidence with it, you may actually be able to, you know, do enough to actually prevent migraines from taking place by making sure that you're, you know, even when you're, you're in the fight or flight, that you, you, you calm down as quickly as possible and then you, you warm your hands as a result. Okay. So it's a wonderful technique. And, and does it work? Yeah. We treated migraines all the time. Uh, in fact, that that was uh, a lot of what we did. We did migraines, muscle tension, headaches. And for muscle tension headaches, we don't use thermal biofeedback. We use EMG, by electromyographic muscle tension biofeedback, because it's a different mechanism. Muscle tension headaches are about muscle tension, so you have to tap muscle tension. Uh, migraines are about vascular stuff, so you have to attack the vascular side of that. Um, if you have this is this is just a I don't know if it's either here or there, but uh, you know caffeine oh. is considered a yes. vasoconstrictor. Yes, yes. So yes. before it can actually help. It you. can cause and then help migraines. Yes, yes. Oh my goodness. Yes, so, yes, yes. Man, and you say I shouldn't have drank this cup of coffee. I got a migraine. And then you have another one. You no, say, Ah, oh, I feel better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can do oh both. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Classic yeah. symptom of caffeine withdrawal is a headache. Yeah. 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 Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> the medication for migraines has, has caffeine in it. Yes. Uh, yes. And and again, it's all about constricting those blood vessels back down to normal size, so you stop agitating the surrounding pain receptors. Okay. That's the whole key to the process. Stop. <laughs> stop messing with those pain receptors, and and you'll feel better. So okay. So. So biofeedback is, is used for pain-related complaints and anxiety-related complaints. We have all sorts of phobias that we can, we can tackle. And Tomo uh, phobia, that's fear of insects. Hydro, what do you think hydro is? Water. Water, right. A nomo. A nomo. I'm trying to think of what a nomo is. Oh, nomo, nomo. Just N-O-M-A. That's actually uh, fear of cell phone contact. Mobile phone contact. Yeah, there's a word for it, I guess. <laughs> Algo. Uh, that's uh, uh, fear of um, heights. Toco. Oh no, this is fear of pain. I'm sorry. Toco is fear of pregnancy. Okay. Agora, fear of being in places you can't readily escape from. Alto, heights, glosso, public speaking, techno, technology. Fear, you know, all sorts of phobias out there. There's even adoraphobia. <laughs> That's fear of fur. Oh. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where they got it, but that's, there's adorophobia. Figure, okay. But, but here are some common fears. People have fears of spiders and snakes and mice. I don't know. You guys, you guys, you're okay with all these three things, or I don't, I don't like them. But birds, because they kind of swoop in. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Cockroach. Cockroach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are creepy, aren't they? Yeah, no, I, mean, I don't like snakes. Snakes. But I have touched one. Okay. In the presence of other kids, just even, to show that even I can though do you it. don't like it, oh, I can't. You can you can manage it and still do it. Okay. Oh, 
I don't have a fear of any of those things, but uh, being vulnerable to them, like if somebody decides to drop me in a bin full of rattlesnakes, oh, okay. then I would be very afraid before I got bitten several times. Okay. But if I just see one, I think it's beautiful, you know, spider. Well, he, he, he ran across a, a rattlesnake the other day. Yeah, yeah. a couple weeks ago. Fresh. We surprised how far a middle-aged man carrying a 40-pound backpack can jump <laughs> mid-stride <laughs> when oh, I yeah. step over the rattlesnake. He yeah. didn't see the rattlesnake until didn't he see it. on it. Was he a biggin or like a pygmy or what? No, it's, uh, it was a red diamond rattlesnake. Oh. It wasn't very big, but a beautiful animal. Took yeah. a couple pictures of it. Yeah, yeah. nice. And, and, and the guy came running out because he, he screamed or something. Yeah. And he said, what's going on? And he said, the snake. And the guy... I guess got a show. Yeah, unfortunately, you just smashed it, so. But I don't like no animals. No animals. Ooh, even if I bring my little pawns. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I remember that. My little baby pawns, which they got their hair shampooed yesterday, <laughs> toenails cut. Uh -huh. and, you know, nowadays, some people are even having their, their fingernails oh my painted. Goodness. No, I don't think so. But <laughs> <laughs> Some people are nervous. So, so you, even if they have fingernails, I don't like dogs. I don't like, dog, I don't like no, no really? animals. Really? Even if fingernails painted, maybe bows in their hair? No. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe <laughs> dyed hair or sunglasses? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've seen okay. that with dogs. I guarantee you, you would melt if you had a baby polar bear playing with you. No. Oh. <laughs> a baby polar bear? You see how cute they are? Have you seen how cute they are? No, no, I would, if, no, I would cry. Baby polar bears. I don't like birds. I don't like nothing. I don't like no animals. I don't even like chicken. But, oh, and I eat it. Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> like chicken. I like it. I don't like chicken. I don't like it. I cannot do it. I went to a farm one time and I, I cried. Can you tell by the way? Are you terrified? You know, I, you know, I had another student once. No, no furry. Nothing. Even if they were uh, kittens. She, she didn't want to be in that. Even a picture. A picture of a kid. Wow. Wow. So, yeah. I just can't be in the same room. Yeah. But I could see a picture. You can see a picture. Okay, with a picture. So if I'm in the same room, I will find them. I will find them cute. Like, yeah. I saw them. They were really cute. Yeah. And I would just never get into my office. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that. You wouldn't go down. I don't touch them. Oh, oh, like, I would actually agree with cockroaches. Yeah. Cockroaches. <laughs> yeah. Part of me wants yeah. to. So, so cockroaches. Yeah, I agree. Not a good thing. Joke. It's not good. How about that? Yeah. You no, like that, huh? I would have a heart attack. Yeah, I should be. Back in the romantic era, they equated those things to demons and carnets. With women during their pregnancy, I and mean, I, I know the moms is taught as a yes, yes. It, uh, this is very similar. I mean, it's basically just trying to teach you how to control physiological responses and to control pain. And it's empowered. You know, you want to empower people instead of depending big on pillars. Mm -hmm. This is this is more empowering, um, more internal control versus extra. Um, and again, I'm not anti. I'm definitely in support of medications. The right situations for, for, for different populations. But this can be helpful for some people too. Um, and, and you know, I, I'm i okay with these three things, uh, but uh, I have to admit, if I was walking just around the house or something, suddenly I almost came close to stepping on a snake, I'd have a startle response. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's very normal to have that sort of thing. But, 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 you know, if, if I was in a controlled environment, that sort of thing, I could get to a point and touch hold a snake or whatever, spider that sort of thing. Um, in fact, there's one spider, are you guys okay with There's one spider, I think, just <laughs> oddly cute. Is this the, the... Okay, now, cute is the word here. Oh, look at that. Cute. These are really, really, really tiny, <laughs> tiny, tiny. Jumping. 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 I'm sorry to keep going on this, but I love animals. I just, 
I, we were painting a house today and spraying the exterior of the garage, and the friend, uh, my friend who was spraying at the time, uh, he just was unaware, he just sprayed right over a little lizard, oh. which is not good, it's oil-based paint, you know, oh. and I felt so bad, you know, I, I, I jumped up, I jumped up and I grabbed him, and I ran to the hose, oh, and you know, the whole time he, I could, he was just oh. inside of my hands, like, let me, let me, let me, I got him, I got him under the water, and it was like, then it was like I was holding a baby, oh, like, it, 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 he kept like rubbing his, his eyes on my hand, because you know, the paint must have been hurting his eyes, but he like settled down and was like, but uh, I'm, I'm amazed you actually caught it, but it, it was probably incapacitated by the, the paint. Yeah, I mean, he was trying to get away, but I just like jumped up and grabbed him. Wow. And I... Wow, you're like a pita. Yeah, I would just laugh. I mean, could you imagine being covered in oil based paint and getting in your eyes? It hurts. Not the skin, but the eyeballs. It's got to hurt, right? Sorry. You got to save these animals, right? Well, here's a here's a little standalone machine. It's very old. It's probably antique by now, but it's a. I got it from Radio Shack years ago. It's, it's a galvanic skin response thing. And so it will actually, uh, you know, measure your galvanic skin response. I don't know if anybody wants to try it. Is it kind of like a lie detector? Well, you know, here's the thing about lie detectors. People say that they will detect whether you're lying or not. That's not true. It will detect whether you're anxious or not. That's basically it. So if you're being anxious about just being asked a question, you could actually, you know, elevate, yeah. and it could be interpreted as lying, and it could very well be lying, but it's not any proof that someone is lying. It's just proving that they're anxious. That's Can all. you buy something like that nowadays? You can't find these anymore, unless maybe you go on eBay. Um, but you can find other things like this. Does anybody want to try it out? I remember you doing that to someone in okay. class. Okay. All right, so, yeah. so I'm going to take... Debbie, you okay with the camera? Sure. Uh, one finger here. One finger here. You see, you got the probe down here. This is the probe. And so we just want to have a touch with both fingers. And then you turn it on. And usually it works. <laughs> Unless my batteries are dead. Oh, she's very relaxed. Very low. You hear it? Yeah. Usually it's, wait, wait, now. See, it's coming to light. What you do is you try to reset it until you kind of get to this, to a level of relaxation. and The person kind of focuses on his or her breathing, and some positive imagery, that sort of thing. And then when, when you get to a relaxed uh, spot, then you say, do you want to see a spider? You're okay with a spider? A real spider? Yeah. <laughs> I guess sure. you okay. okay. As long as it doesn't jump. Oh, uh, <laughs> you can hear it speeding up. Oh, <laughs> 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 I'll show you a little clip of something really good at. Um, 
But my my statement of the problem was basically, you know, why why do some people benefit from biofeedback interventions and others don't? Well, we got we got variable effects, we got individual differences, and I just wanted to kind of understand what's going on. And I thought confidence plays a role somewhere in in the process. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was kind of looking at. Mm -hmm. um, and and here was my hypothesis. I I, I kind of figured. People with moderate or high levels of biofeedback confidence would probably do better with biofeedback and the treatment outcome compared to people with low confidence. That was my hypothesis. Nobody had ever done that. Uh, so if you look at it in terms of independent and dependent variable, your independent variable is your confidence level. And then your, the outcome, the treatment outcome depends upon your confidence level, right? Mm -hmm. So if I, my theory, moderate or high confidence, treatment outcome better, my theory. So I wanted to see if that would happen. And here, usually when you compare a couple of variables, you can use correlation coefficients. You've heard of that, right? And you know the range is from the positive one, the minus one. If there's no correlation, then it just, it's just, it's chaos. There's no organs organization to the, to the scattered plot. But if there is a relationship, there's a line that starts to form. You know, it's, it gets closer and closer together. This is, is getting close to minus one, which means that we have an inverse relationship. As one variable goes up, the other one goes down. So if confidence goes up, if the this is what I found, which is what I found. If confidence goes up, your treatment success goes down. That would be an inverse relationship. So, now, there was no such thing as a biofeedback intervention confidence scale. So I went out and I created one. And that's quite a complicated process in and of itself. It could, it could actually be your entire dissertation to come up with a scale, to validate it, to Make it a reliable instrument and that sort of thing. But I went ahead and, because I didn't have anything out there, I made one. And I uh, ended up getting a lot of expert opinions on the items and the scale, sent it out to expert judges and that sort of thing. Eventually created a scale that was demonstrated to be very reliable and very valid. Okay? So that's the scale I used to measure confidence. Then uh, I had to assume that, of course, Backing up, I had assumed that was a valid and reliable scale. It doesn't, it doesn't really help me if that's a bad scale. You know, so you have to assume that you're picking a good scale. Then I had to assume, when I tested out my theory, my hypothesis, that when, when the clients filled out the survey, they'd be honest, right, and genuine. Now sometimes, if people know what you're looking for, they try to give you what they think you want, you know, there's some unconscious or even conscious stuff to, to help you. Sometimes it's unconscious. Sometimes there are people out there that they know you're looking for something, they'll try to prove you wrong. So you are being conscious or conscious stuff. Or so we use something called deception. It's a very fancy word, deception. <laughs> we don't tell them exactly what we're looking for. And we can use deception in research as long as we're honest when we're done. The research. We go back and tell them what we did, exactly why we why we used the little deception so it wouldn't bias the results and that sort of thing. So as long as you own up to it, you can use it. So uh, I I assumed in my study that a little deception would actually help provide more genuine results. And I also uh, assumed that if I could standardize the treatment process, that would help too. You know. So I used one biofeedback technician, and she would use a standardized treatment, six-week treatment protocol, where she would do this the first session, this the second session, this the third session, fourth session, fifth, and then sixth session, for only migraine sufferers. The only people we led into the study were people who were suffering from migraines. They took the, they took the survey, they went through the treatment process, and then we had them rate you know, how they felt what happened to the migraines in terms of intensity and frequency. And what I found out 
was that if you did have moderate levels or high levels of biofeedback confidence, you tended to have more success in terms of reducing the frequency as well as the intensity of the pain regarding the migraines. So I have a question about perception. What, so did you tell them or whatever you told them as far as perception was concerned? At the end, did you tell them what they actually did before they took the survey, or was that after the survey? It's after the survey, after they were done with the treatment process, then I sat down with them and I said, hey, you know, the survey wasn't just a general thing that we do with everybody. It was actually, you know, it was actually to try to figure out if confidence played a role oh. in, in the process. So you, 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 you tell them, and then you tell them a little bit about what you found out, too. You, know, they, you owe it to them to tell them that they agreed to participate in your research. All right. So, so my rationale for the study was to, I wanted to understand why some people benefit, why some people don't, and I thought maybe a piece of the puzzle was your confidence in the intervention. Right? And, and so that's kind of what drove me here. Now, delimitations. This is actually a hospital I worked at, uh, General Eisenhower, not General, General. I, I did my internship at Eisenhower, but this is uh, General Leonard Wood Army Medical Hospital in um, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And, and that's where we did the biofeedback program. Delimitations, you're in the driver's car, this is what you control. I, I decided to, to only use one hospital, <laughs> my hospital, because that's the one I had the only control over, you know, so I used one hospital. Uh, types of referrals accepted, I controlled and accepted only migraine sufferers into, into the study. Because I wanted something standardized. I didn't want to be treating migraines over here, uh, generalized anxiety over here, a back pain over here. You know, I didn't want it. I just wanted one presenting problem. So I limited it to, to migraines. And it was a six-week program with a bio, one biofeedback technician. So that's, I was in the driver's car for that stuff. Limit, limita limitations in and of itself. Well, one thing that actually was very limiting, I had no control over who actually, you know, uh, got into, um, you know, who came for a referral to the biofeedback clinic. I couldn't go out and, you know, pay people to come in and get treated. I mean, I could have done that, but, but I would have been very poor if I had decided to do that. So, so you know, in the end, I didn't get the numbers that I would have liked to have gotten. 120 or something like that would have been a good, a good number, but I ended up with only 40 people. So that was a limitation. And, and, and you know, uh, self-referrals, other referrals, you know, very dependent upon, again, people volunteering to come in because they heard about biofeedback, that I work through in my business, or they maybe have been referred by a physician. But I had no control over the physicians in the referral process. Uh, and, and really, even though you try to standardize something, what if your technician is tired on a particular day? Or uh, she finds out she's pregnant, or uh, which she did <laughs> during this process. She was very, you know, uh, your hormones might go up and down, or depending on what the day or whatever. What happens if you, you had a fight with your spouse or something? Those are things you can't control. So those would be mediations and treatment. So those are some some limitations. You have to acknowledge the possibility that you could be limitation. Power of confidence. Now I didn't know about this guy uh, before I did my study. I found out about him probably a couple years ago. And what he does is he does surgeries without any medications. No anesthesia, no medications. And, and the majority of the surgeries are done. And in a second, I'll show you a clip of someone going through hernia surgery without medications. Nothing. Okay. Now, if you're squirmish about this stuff, you could. I'll just tell you: close your eyes. Don't don't look at the video. You okay, just don't look. If you're squirmish, <laughs> you, you know, if you're okay with it, you know, keep your eyes open. All right. But uh, what's amazing is that. This person is fully awake, fully alert, talking to the physician and all that stuff. And at the very end, you're going to pan and you're going to see her face. You pan the camera, you're going to see her face. You'll have to tell me if you think she looks like she's in pain. 
but remember, no medication. Don't feel pain. There, there is that condition. Yes. Because maybe Some that's what she that has. Because I know that I'd be screaming so loud. <laughs> the power of the mind is so strong. We just don't tap into it without crying and things. Yeah. Oh. yeah. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. Oh. You could do this. I mean, it is very possible. I was high for a minute yes. waiting for this. I'll, 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 I'll tell you one thing. I took your class. <laughs> Years ago. I don't know, that was okay. With the spider and everything, I was just laughing just watching. <laughs> but I remember you talking about all the biofeedback and everything, and then I told you that I had a, recently, at that time, got a, diagnosed with cold induced hives. I, I would go surfing, I had to go swimming, and I would break out. I would break out in high, uh, hives. Oh, wow. And I mean, I've been surfing all my life, I've been in the ocean all my life. And so I went to uh, get diagnosed that cold induced hives. I break out when I get extremely cold. Cold, right, right? So then you talked about raising the temperature. Yeah. And you talked about all that. So I, I told you, I asked you in class, so maybe after class, I said. So basically, the reason why I'm breaking out is because I'm a weak mind. <laughs> and you just started laughing. It just started. And yeah. I was laughing now because. Because I don't buy into the weak mind, I just believe that it is a thing that we can learn if we're given the tools. You know, we can learn certain things. Wherever we're at in life, we can always go and run up the ladder. From that class mm -hmm. till this summer, I have not broken out since. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. What did you do? So what no, you, well, just, you just said to yourself? No, well, well, I mean, I mean, just the idea of. Uh, <laughs> Calming yourself down, warming yourself up. Mm -hmm. So you just did, listening. You did you. it on your own. Yeah. You did it on your own. Yeah, but, I you mean, but I just, I just kept joking with all my friends. I have a weak mind. I have to work on this. Let's <laughs> do. Yeah, and it finally now the funny thing is, mm -hmm. I took that class probably six years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I've been. I come to California, and all I do is surf because mm -hmm. I don't have time to surf where I live just too busy. So I started to feel myself break out. Just a little it, it didn't break out totally and I started laughing. And I, I wondered it was you broke the cycle when you laughed? I I, I yeah. It, I, I laughed because I wondered if this was all brought on knowing the fact that I would be taking another class from you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm full circle, you know? and so I'm just laughing out in the ocean, laughing to myself. Okay, I, I, I'll show you tomorrow a little video clip of a guy who who ran in frigid weather, just in shorts, bare barefoot, you know, uh, below freezing, you know, who did a half marathon in bare feet, mm. only a pair of shorts and a little cap on his head, and 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 I'll find that clip and I'll show it to you. The power of the mind is immense. Yeah. We don't tap into it. I think we can tap. Yeah, you know, it, it is. Yeah. But to be honest, you know, how many of us would actually choose to go through surgery without any medications? How many of us would do that? Without any I don't medication? think. How many of us know that it's possible? Yeah, that's another question. Do we, you know, if you don't even know it's possible, chances are you would never even conceive of the concept of doing it. Even if you happen? know it's possible, would you do it? <laughs> it gives you the option. What if I give you a million dollars? No, to go that's through not the truth. Uh, but if you taught me dollars. how, but if you taught yeah. me how to do it, and that's the thing, I think that's your point. Yeah, you if I gave you a million so dollars and I taught you the techniques. This the woman who had the surgery. She had to have been a she, specialist. She went, in, she went through some training. And they, they, they knew that she could withstand. She she went through some training to prep her for the surgery. How long okay. was the surgery? Uh, How long was the training? Guys, <laughs> an hour, two hours long. Yeah. Some sure. people are actually can't tolerate general yeah. anesthetic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. some people are life threatening. Or ask these guys. So they, they're so for be in a situation to either have the surgery without medications <laughs> or die. Oof. You know, if you're in that situation, your back's against the wall. You're going to try to learn how to do this. Question: Shari asked during that if yeah, pregnant women if. Mm -hmm. um, they can use this, and she said, but don't you feel pain? 
that you do feel pain, but you control it. Actually, the people who, you know, I, I have another clip. I, I'll try to find it and I'll show it to you guys tomorrow. It's another guy who, it's a guy who went through criminal history. Some mommy thinks in that way. But he, he says, and, and people who have gone through this will say they don't really feel pain. They feel movement. They feel stuff going on. But it, it's not pain. It, they don't perceive it to be pain. Uh, and, and even after surgery, this guy who goes through the hernia surgery, uh, the doctor talks to him and says, you know, with other people, you know, after they're done with the surgery, we, we give you pain medication to go home with. And, 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 and look at you, you know, you're doing pretty good. He said, I, I, was, I keep telling myself just to, I'm okay, there's, I'm not, not to feel any pain. So even after the surgery, you know, you, you, you think, oh, you get hyped up to do this, and you can, you can manage for maybe an hour or two hours, but then it stops. No, this guy, he, he went through the surgery, post-surgery. He did. He took some medication at home with him, but my guess is uh, he did not use it because he was still able to, to, to basically make the thing not, not do it. It became something else. It became movement or pressure, not pain. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as you're talking about this, I remember, you know, uh, you ever had your wisdom pulled out? Uh, oh, you? I had four of them. Yeah, so, and I was all uh, drugged up. Yeah. But you feel the tug, and then tug, you're like, tug, tug. I don't feel the pain, but I feel tug, all tug. everything going on. Exactly. And I'm thinking, exactly. depression feels, and I'd be laughing, I'm sure I'd be laughing while they do the surgery because of all the movement going on. Yeah. Well, you saw her. I mean, they're moving this. The testament. Oh, they were just digging it in like a sandbox. So, so, uh, Dr. Escudero, he called it no easy therapy. And it kind of makes sense, no easy therapy. Oh, it's not easy, but uh, it actually is easy therapy. Yeah, yeah. Any questions? Any other questions? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's okay. We talk about it. <laughs> the, the thing is, you could do this. I know it's some, to some of you. So you're going to teach us? No, I'm not. No, no, I, won't, I won't even go there. <laughs> but you could do it if you, if you want. It's just amazing how the mind, the mind works. Yeah, yeah, you know, it is amazing. I mean, and, and, and we just don't even know the potential, you know, how far it can go. I remember... I was uh, years ago in college in my undergraduate program. I was I was at a bank. I was depositing or taking some money out. I can't remember. And I heard the screeching tires, and there was a car accident right outside the bank. I ran out, and I was the first one on the scene. And the uh, the guy who was driving the car was getting out of the car slowly. But, but the girl in the back, she was in in considerable pain, and and it, you know obviously there was no ambulance yet. It would take a while for the ambulance to get there. But I got in the back seat. I said, don't move her. Don't move her. Because he wanted to move her. And you, you, you know, you're not supposed to move somebody in the accident. You could do more damage. Don't move her. And I just started talking to her, very relaxing. And and her pain was, was when I first got there, way up there. But we were able to get it get it down to where she was relaxed. And she was, you know. And I, and I said, the ambulance is here now. You're going to be okay. You're going to be she, she said, thank you. Uh, and, and, and I remember being in a, when we were on a Maranatha trip, we were building churches and, and that sort of thing back at Andrews. Uh, we went to uh, Belize. And I remember we were uh, at the construction site one time, and one of the gals got a horrific headache. And we had no, no medications with us, you know, for, for whatever reason. We just didn't have any. So I, I just worked with her with some relaxation techniques, and within about 15 minutes, her headache was gone. You know, it, it's amazing what the mind can do. Um, but we just don't realize we can do these things sometimes. What, uh, what, what, what comes into play when you're in shock? Oh, when you're in shock, your body is, is going into, it's trying to go into survival mode, but it, it's actually in a dangerous situation. You know, it's, it's, you know, you, you really need treatment. Quickly, you need you need to go into shock. Yeah, because I um I, I once 
It's, uh, got a really bad uh, cut on my leg. Oh, yeah. To uh-huh. where it went. You know, I saw bone and I saw meat. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's what, that's what, that's what. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just kind of became really relaxed. And yeah. But, sh- but, but Shaq eventually you start shivering, you start, you know, you, you've gone beyond where the endorphins have kicked in. Now it's the endorphins are wearing away, and you're actually, your body is fighting for survival. Yeah. 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 That was yeah. a strange sensation. It is. And, and, and you, you feel like you can't stop. I mean, I was in a motorcycle accident, quit my job. Yeah. And my, my teeth were hanging out. Oh, you know, cool. one, one actually was, you, you can see a scar right here still, um, if you look closely enough. Mm-hmm. One, one tooth went right through that, I guess. And, and they put the teeth back and they wired me shut eventually. Um, but, but, you know, and it was only a, a couple minutes before the ambulance got there. But on the ride to the hospital, which was only just a few minutes, I was starting to go, I knew I was going to shock. You know, I was thankful that I got to the hospital quickly. And um, you know, they, they, they got me situated. Eventually put me back together. <laughs> that was fun. <clears throat> Not, but, uh, but you know the, the power of the mind it is there if you know it's there it's there and we can tap into it if we learn to tap into it can you use biofeedback with children that have behavior problems uh, we can use biofeedback EEG the, the, uh, the brain waves for like ADHD kids That's we teach them how to focus on improving data because beta is where you can concentrate and pay attention and be more relaxed and that sort of thing. So beta is what we try to train ADHD to And that can be helpful with the game problems. What about like opposition? Opposition defiant, not typically unless they have a comorbid condition of ADHD. Then they can see that. We usually see a progression. ADHD, we don't treat it. Sometimes you'll see a whole uh, significant proportion of the ADHD folks untreated will go on to have OTD, oppositional defiant disorder. You don't treat it, conduct disorder. You don't treat it, what comes next? Some of you know. Antisocial. Antisocial personality disorder. Yeah. And it's not 100% that folks go through that progression, but it's enough of a uh, proportion that it's gotten the attention of some of the other. So they want to treat, stop it at the earliest point. So stop it at ADHD so it doesn't go on to ODD, it doesn't go on to CD, it doesn't go on to antisocial resources. And some of those um, computer games, or a computer for EEG, somebody got smart and figured out how to hook up a PlayStation 3 and use actual video games um, to help the kids uh, with, with the beta. The yeah, they, yeah, they learn to... So they, they learn to fun, like, control a car or a spaceship with beta waves. And, and the, the better they get at it, the more relaxed they get, the less the behavioral problems are in play, the less that that happens. Uh, so, so linking games, especially with kids, but even with adults, it's, it's, a, fun, it's a good combination. So there's, there's a lot of potential. We're just beginning to tap into it. And I wouldn't be surprised if, I mean, they, we've seen some research with substance abuse in EEG. You know, uh, they're going for alpha theta training instead of beta training. Uh, because, why? Because substance abusers typically are self medicating to relax, right? They don't know how to relax. So if you teach them how to relax, they may not mean, does that make sense? They may not need to use the joy to relax, right? I have a question. Let's see if we can make sense out of this. Because I, I had a student once, an uh, eighth grader, kind of big, not as big as me. And he, he had, uh, he's been diagnosed with, I'm not sure, but, uh, it didn't matter because I'm just going to, I'm just going to love him. But well, one day he was just so mad. I never seen him so mad. And he stormed off, and then when he came back on campus, he started cussing me out. You? Yeah. And, and you hadn't done anything? I did something. <laughs> I did something. Well, what happened was uh, his ride, he made his ride weight, and he does that every day. Oh, 
Okay. And so the person said, oh, I feel like leaving. I said, go, oh, leave. Let them learn. <laughs> so the person left. Oh, and, yes. and, and you, were, you, were, you were just holding him accountable, and he didn't like it. Yeah, and so I said, uh, he said, what happened? I said, they left. What happened? You took too long, and he started <laughs> off, and he, went, he came back, and he started F, and I never seen him just blow up. And he said, I'm going to hit you. Now he, he's, he's storming towards me. Uh-huh. And the only thing I could think of doing, uh-huh. I just stopped, and I just sat on the ground immediately. Yeah, you de-escalated. That's right. I just sat on the ground. That's he right. looked at me. He didn't know what to do. That's right. He stood there, <laughs> and then a couple seconds later, he just started crying. Yeah, you you defused it wonderfully. Oh. Yeah, and, and, and this is actually a wonderful technique. When somebody is angry and they're coming to you, and you're standing up, and they're standing up, and you're angry, and you're one of the first things that you want to try to do is to find a place to sit down and, and, and just be as relaxed as you possibly. Oftentimes, that will help them, you know, disengage from the 